Well, it's my pleasure now to introduce someone who I know has that same modality because she is absolutely fantastic and is involved deeply in the care of patients with myeloma, uh, Amy Pierre. So Amy is um, a nurse practitioner uh, and has been a very active member of our IMF Nurse Leadership Board. She and I have uh, done a lot of these gigs together over this last year. Amy, I hope you're not sick of me yet, my friend. Um, at, uh, and she does amazing work at Memorial Sloan Kettering as well as with the IMF community. So I will turn it to you, Amy, to share with us a little bit about, um, as we've said, we're not treating myeloma, treating people. And so side effects and symptoms are an inherent part of what we face. And I know we're running a few minutes late, Amy, but you take your time to do what you need to do. And then we'll have times for Q&A at the end. I'll just remind the crowd as Amy begins to speak, feel free to enter your questions. I know many have been entered. And just as a reminder, as we said from the start, that this is being recorded and the slides will be available afterwards as well. So you can digest all of this information that we're uh, giving to you. So Amy, I'll turn it to you, my friend. Thank you so much, Dr. McHale. What a wonderful introduction and always, a I could never get sick of you. Always a pleasure speaking with you and being invited to these events. So, and I just want to speak to Bonnie. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful story and your myeloma journey. It's so inspiring, such an important message of hope and encouraging patients to seek out, you know, the best care possible and a great segue into my talk. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm a nurse practitioner at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I'm also a clinical director at Flatiron Health and a proud member of the IMF Nurse Leader board. So I'm going to talk to you about some common symptoms that patients with myeloma can experience and how best to manage them. So let's dive right then. We can go into the next slide. So your healthcare team tackles your myeloma in two ways, right? We do direct cell kill of the myeloma as well as supportive therapies designed to prevent disease-related side effects and improve symptoms. And your myeloma treatment is designed specifically to reduce cancer burden to allow for effective disease control that is durable while at the same time trying to balance those side effects to treatment. And those supportive therapies may not necessarily design to kill the myeloma, but rather prevent medical issues that can occur directly related to the myeloma. And this could be bone strengthening agents, preventative infection agents, and also overall symptom management. But these therapies, of course, designed to improve overall survival and control your disease. But the ultimate goal really is to control your disease so you can have good quality of life. So we can advance to the next slide. But of course, you know, both myeloma itself and the treatment can cause side effects, manifesting as physical and psychological symptoms. And let's not forget the financial burden that some of these treatments can cause. So there was actually a study that was published in 2016 that did a systematic review of literature to understand the prevalence of symptoms in patients with myeloma. And this study reported about 27 distinct symptoms that were consistently reported. And the most prevalent were pain, um, as you know, of course, and fatigue that Bonnie touched upon, and problems with overall functioning, including fatigue, bowel disturbances, pain, neuropathy, impaired physical function and sexual dysfunction, and of course, emotional symptoms too, depression, anxiety, sleep disturbance, and even change in cognitive and social functioning. And financial difficulties were real. It was reported in close to 80% of these studies as well. And we know that optimum quality of life and good symptom management in myeloma can really only be achieved by routinely assessing symptoms throughout the treatment. And it's important to have this open dialogue with patients to help them get through treatment effectively and have minimal symptom burden. So the next slide, we're gonna to start to talk about some of these symptoms, including clotting. So this is known as deep vein thrombosis or DVT and pulmonary embolisms. They're both clotting problems that we take very seriously and risk factors developing a DVT or PE include a personal or a family history of clotting, maybe lifestyle if you're mostly sedentary, not moving around very much or obese, and even certain medical interventions like surgery. And the symptoms can manifest in several ways. It could be swelling in one leg, or if there's clots in both legs, it could be symmetric swelling. There could be a tightness in the leg, an ache, a dull ache in the leg, or even redness of the leg as well. 
Now, sometimes a clot can leave the leg and travel to the lungs, and that's known as a pulmonary embolism. And that can manifest as chest pain or chest tightness or even shoulder pain, difficulty breathing, even anxiety or even a rapid heart rate. So how we look for this is we know scans to do and imaging to do to find these things. It's a medical emergency to us. So if you ever have symptoms such as this, promptly report it to your provider. We'll also make sure you're on medications to help prevent this from happening if you're on medications that increase your risk of developing clots, but also maybe adjust your medications accordingly. You need to be on blood thinners to help your body basically naturally resorbs the clot, but the blood thinners are designed to help you prevent clotting in the future now that we know you're apt to clot. But there's also changes in lifestyle management, including stop smoking, good weight management, and activity. Moving frequently is important, particularly if you're going to be sitting for a prolonged period of time, even such as today. Make sure you're taking some breaks to walk around. And if for some reason you do have to do long travel in a car, make sure you're pumping your legs. That simulates walking and taking breaks to walk around. Let's go to the next slide. So we can see gastrointestinal symptoms, also known as GI symptoms, with our myeloma therapies, including diarrhea and constipation, and some patients may fluctuate between both. So diarrhea could be due to therapy or even laxatives that you're taking, antibiotics, antidepressants, supplements can do this too, and even sugar substitutions can cause diarrhea. That's found in sugar-free candies or sugar-free gum, or even in sugar-free sodas, which you really shouldn't be drinking. Um, the important thing to do is if you're having diarrhea is really replenish, replenish that lost fluid and avoid caffeinated beverages that dry you out. Caffeine is a diuretic. Carbonated beverages are not great too. And these heavily sugared beverages also exacerbate the diarrhea. So take anti-diarrhea medications or some found over the counter or such as Imodium, but we might need to give you prescription um, anti-diarrhea medications like Lamotil. And we do know that diarrhea that's related to lenalidomide um, can be related to bile acid malabsorption. And there are certain medications that we can prescribe that are bile acid sequestrants like Wellcall that can actually help with diarrhea related to lenalidomide. So if you're having a lot of refractory diarrhea to lenalidomide, please talk to your provider about potentially being on a medication such as that. Fiber can help to bulk the stool, slow down the diarrhea, and it's actually also helpful for constipation as well. So constipation can be due to, you know, certain pain medications like opiates and antidepressants, even blood pressure medications can do and certain supplements as well. So increasing your fiber, increasing your fluid, a good diet, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, and um, making sure that you might need to take laxatives to help with the constipation. But of course, there's a delicate balance. Too many laxatives might push you over the edge into loose stools and diarrhea. So you really need to find a good regimen to, to balance it out. So our next slide, we're going to talk about kidney function. So myeloma cells produce that myeloma protein that we've been talking about today, which releases into the bloodstream and can pass into the urine. And this can actually result into kidney damage. And it's really important and critical to protect kidneys when you have myeloma because they're easily susceptible to kidney damage. So risk factors for kidney dysfunction include active, uncontrolled myeloma, particularly our patients who are what we call free lighters, who just manifest their disease as free light chains. And high calcium levels, too, um, is, is really toxic to the kidneys. And there's other medications that can do this, too. Certain diabetic medications or diabetes itself or medication issues. Dehydration is toxic to the kidneys. Your kidneys really need fluid, so you got to drink, drink, drink. And then IV contrast is very toxic to kidneys too. So if you ever have another medical provider who is provided, who's prescribing a CAT scan for you, it's important to understand if they're prescribing that CAT scan with contrast, because it really should be a non-contrast exam. And they can always talk to us and have a phone conversation with us as your myeloma providers, so we can explain why that really isn't a good choice for you. Certain medications can do it too, antibiotics, and like I talked about, contrast dye. How do we prevent this? Fluids. I always tell my myeloma patients, you should be walking around with a bottle of water with you and sipping on that constantly throughout the day and avoid certain toxic medications to the kidneys as possible. As I talked about IV contrast, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are tough on the kidneys as well. And if your kidney dysfunction is related to the myeloma, 
treating the underlying myeloma is really the best way to manage this. And hydration as well. Sometimes we need to go beyond oral hydration and provide IV or intravenous hydration. And sometimes dialysis to get people over that hump. Um, and sometimes we'll successfully be able to get patients off dialysis with good control of their, their myeloma. So the next slide talks about myeloma causing damage to the bones. And this is because myeloma upregulates the activity of certain cells in your body that break down bone. So it can make the bones brittle and weak. And we can see bone disease in upwards of 85% of patients with myeloma. So we have to protect your bones with good bone health good nutrition, um, be cognizant of certain weight bearing activity that you can do, um, make sure you're exercising accordingly, certain medications, vitamin D and calcium if appropriate for you. But the mainstay of treatment for bone disease related to myeloma are our bone strengthening medications. This can include Zometa or Pimidronate and even Denosumab. They all work to kind of um, decrease skeletal related events that can happen related to myeloma and of course improve bone integrity and bone density. If you're having any new bone pain um, in your back or even in your ribs and your legs, please report that to your provider because we need to do imaging to make sure this is not some sort of bony lytic disease related to your myeloma. So our next slide talks about that pesky side effect and frustrating side effect known as peripheral neuropathy. So this is damage to the nerves and it can manifest as numbness or tingling or a prickling sensation in your feet or toes. I've had patients tell me it feels like they're walking around wearing socks and they're not, or they're walking around on rocks and they're not. So it, it can manifest in, in several different ways and it's very uncomfortable. It can even manifest as muscle weakness or a burning sensation or, or increased cold sensitivity. So the best way to manage peripheral neuropathy is really to prevent it. And we know there's certain medications that we prescribe for myeloma that can cause this or even exacerbate it. So bortezomib is a, is a chronic offender of this side effect. And so giving bortezomib weekly versus twice a weekly, giving bortezomib as a subcutaneous injection versus intravenous really can decrease the risk of, of peripheral neuropathy. But we know we might need to pause giving this drug to see if the neuropathy can resolve or back down or sometimes just hold the drug and find something else entirely. So if you are developing this symptom, it's important to notify your, your providers promptly of this because um, about two thirds of this can be reversible related to bortezomib, but that means one third may not be reversible. So we need to be on top of that as well. And there is anecdotal evidence coming out of Dana-Farber where um, a B-complex vitamin can also be helpful with peripheral neuropathy. Um, but there's also medications, you know, uh, Bonnie touched upon Zimbalta. Zimbalta is a great and other tricyclic antidepressants or other antidepressants at low doses are very useful for treating peripheral neuropathy. So, and even gabapentin or um, even uh, Lyrica can be helpful too. So talk to your provider about different ways to, to manage this. And also make sure you have a safe environment at home. If you have trouble feeling your feet, please throw away those throw rugs. We don't want you tripping and falling and having other injuries related to your neuropathy. So our next slide is going to talk about the drug that everyone loves to hate, good old steroids. Now, it's important to remember that all myeloma therapies really work better in combination with steroids, and some of them, like pomalidomide, doesn't even work without steroids. So they're important, but they can be a tough drug to tolerate as they can affect every single body system, as you see on the slide. So we can see mood swings and irritability. And, you know, most of the time I hear that from the spouse of the patient about some of these mood swings rather than from the patient. It can cause blurred vision, cataracts with long-term usage, also difficulty sleeping. We, we encourage our patients to take these medications in the morning um, to try and minimize insomnia related to it, but sometimes patients need prescription sleep aids to help them sleep. It can cause stomach bloating, ingestion, uh, hiccuping, heartburn, so it's important to take steroids with food and make sure you have an antacid as part of your arsenal for your myeloma regimen to help minimize heartburn and ulcers that can come with the steroids. It can increase your risk of developing infections. It's, it kills lymphocytes. So it's important to make sure that infection prevention is, is, is very important in your regimen as well. 
It can cause, like I talked about, weight gain and bloating, swelling in your legs. It can make the skin thick. It can cause muscle weakness or cramping. It can really be troublesome for our patients with diabetes or, or near diabetic because it raises your blood sugars. So we really need to work closely with your endocrinologist because it can actually sometimes push our pre-diabetic patients into diabetes if we're not really managing their blood sugar as well. And it can also affect your blood pressure. So we have to be cognizant of how we're dosing these medications, taking them with food, making sure you're on antacid or um, acid reducers, and also on medications to reduce infections. Our next slide talks about infection prevention. It's always been important for patients, but now more than ever, given the current state of the world with COVID-19. And the reason why infection prevention is so important is that myeloma patients are seven times more likely to be infected than a general population due to their myeloma. And they also have delayed recovery of infection. And this compromised immune system is not just a result of the myeloma, but from treatment itself. So how we prevent infections is good personal hygiene, including good hand washing, avoiding sick contacts, good oral hair, well, good oral care. And sometimes your immune system can be so compromised that we might need to actually bring other medications on board, like Nupigen or Nulacid to boost the white blood cells to get them out of that danger zone. And Immunizations are key, but of course, no live vaccinations, only attenuated vaccinations are important. Your flu vaccines, your pneumococcal vaccines, your um, COVID-19 vaccine, and of course, certain medications that increase your risk of shingles or, or even opportunistic infections like fungal infections, you need to be on some sort of uh, preventative infection medications while you're on your myeloma regimen. So for COVID-19, the best way to prevent it is being avoid being exposed to the illness itself because we know it's mainly spread through respiratory droplets that's caused by someone coughing or sneezing or even talking. So make, make sure you're getting your COVID vaccine, make sure you're wearing a properly fitted mask, avoid situations that increase your risk of exposure such as crowded areas, sick people, unvaccinated folks, make sure you're practicing social distancing, try and bring those events outdoors with family members if you can and to great hand washing, right? Sing that happy birthday song while you're washing your hands um, to make sure that you're having a good, good hand hygiene. So our next slide is going to talk about the emotional side effects from myeloma or myeloma therapy. This really shouldn't be forgotten. It can truly influence every aspect of a patient and their caregiver's life. So we're talking about fatigue. We're talking about anxiety. We're talking about depression. This can affect quality of life and relationships and have many sources, including fatigue, anemia, the, the ability to have reduced physical function can be very fatiguing itself and, and cause depression. Not sleeping well, insomnia can cause fatigue as well. And, and just treatment toxicity, if, it's, if your symptoms are not, not managed well, that can cause a lot of anxiety and depression as well. We know that anxiety is reported in more than a third of our patients and depression nearly a quarter of our patients. So we really need to be assessing this with our patients, not just looking at the physical symptoms, but also the emotional burden that chronic myeloma therapy can take its toll on our patients. And we did touch upon some financial concerns as well that can happen. And, and you know, patients are on lots of therapies over and over again, and, and that can have financial toxicity end of life discussions can provoke a lot of anxiety and depression for our patients and caregivers. And even change in social and sexual dysfunction are really highlighted as a sources of this emotional distress. But you know, people don't talk about this with their providers. So make sure you're talking to your provider to see if we can help you with this, we can refer you to social work, or maybe we need a therapist on board or even be involved in, in social support groups or either other community groups, maybe church or whatever is good for you, you know, mindful um, based meditation or spirituality, we can help you find what is the most appropriate way to manage some of these symptoms, even in addition to medication management. So our next slide talks about the financial burden of myeloma. It's important to talk about this because financial toxicity can manifest in several ways. It can come from medication costs, prescription costs, loss of income due to missed time off of work. But there's maybe funding out there to help with these costs, including nonprofit organizations that provide grants, and also many pharmaceutical companies can provide copay assistance. So please ask if there's resources available to you to help find financial assistance, 
whether it be through social worker or a financial resource specialist at your hospital or clinic. And feel free to contact the IMF info line as well for additional guidance, as we're really always here to help you. So our next slide talks a little bit about our communication tool. So now that you're armed with all this knowledge, I want to introduce you to this tool designed specifically for patient myeloma. It was designed to keep the patient in the forefront and understand the patient's preferences and allow the patient to be an active participant in their care plan. It was created in collaboration with myeloma specialists, myeloma patients, caregivers, our support group leaders, and of course my colleagues on the nurse leadership board at the IMF. And it's designed for the patient to empower themselves to learn more about their myeloma, their treatment journey, and asking questions about current and future expectations. So it's important to utilize this tool during various conversations and pivotal moments of your myeloma journey. So not just you know, the first time you're seeing your myeloma patient or your oncologist, but when your treatment stops working, when you start a new treatment, whenever there's a change in your life priorities, or whenever you have an important question or concern, pull out this tool, review the questions, and share it with your provider. So our next slide shows you the myriad of resources available to help you, including patient brochures on a variety of topics that are downloadable and available on our website. We have our Empower website dedicated to removing barriers to care and improving outcomes of myeloma for all our African-American patients. We have our IMF TV series with Dr. Dury, and I spoke of before, of course, our IMF info line. So please feel free to use these resources to help you during your myeloma journey to empower you with knowledge of your disease and allow you to be a dynamic participant in your care. So thank you so much. Wow. Uh, thank you, uh, Amy, for um, a mountain of information, but yet presented clearly and uh, with a lot of resources uh, for everyone to enjoy. So thank you uh, and to you. So thank you so much. That was I really enjoyed that. It was a great lecture. Um, you always speak so well, Amy. Thank you so much. Thank just you. Remind... I try to stay on time as much as possible. Oh, no, you're, you're great. We will take a few minutes, I think, Kelly, now for, for questions. Remind people that they can enter the, their questions. Sure thing. We've got, I think we have about, yeah, go over and take a look at the questions and answers. It might be related to Amy's conversation. Yeah, we, we've got a few good questions here. Maybe I can jump in and ask you one, uh, Amy, here, and we'll take a few minutes before uh, Kelly wraps us up here. Um, someone asked a really good question about, is it possible to treat or release neuropathy by using acupuncture with traditional herbal medicines? I know that there's been lots of work in this field, and I know you know a bit about it, so you're the best one to answer that. That is a great question, and thanks for calling that out. I didn't speak on acupuncture, which has been shown in the literature and research to help with peripheral neuropathy. And I can tell you that we actually... Um, if you can go on your computer, MSK has a wonderful supplement and herbal website that you can actually check in, type in any sort of herb, and you can see how it can potentially be interacting with your treatment, um, how that herb is used potentially in cancer care or not. So there, there are ways that we can sort of attack some of these side effects, peripheral neuropathy through, through holistic medications, but it's our supplements, but it's really important to do your due diligence and, and research about this. And also importantly, talk to your healthcare provider team because they may have recommendations or can you even refer you to an acupuncturist or herbalist that they have a good relationship with. Excellent. Thank you. If Amy. I can just add add one thing uh, to Please. what Amy Amy said, uh, we have done a study actually on acupuncture in uh, neuropathy, and uh, the benefit uh, in our study, which is published, and the fellow who did the study, John Memorial, and the breast group, so you might want to talk to her, um, showed benefit in patients that have painful peripheral neuropathy, and the benefit was quite quick. So the regular neuropathy, which is the numbness and the tingling, does really respond very well to acupuncture, but the painful peripheral neuropathy does respond. Excellent. Very similar to what they found in diabetes. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, no, I've had many patients benefit from that. Um, Amy, one more on your end. I know our time's going quickly, but is there any evidence that long-term use of gabapentin can contribute to dementia? That is an interesting question. I myself am not aware of that. I know, I mean, 
anything can happen with medications, right? If you look at a package insert, there's gonna be a slew of possible side effects. But I think it's important if you're noticing cognitive dysfunction, speak to your, your, your care team about this and see if you need to see a neurologist for cognitive testing. Um, and they can really understand the true source of the cognitive dysfunction and see if there's an, an alternative cause and not necessarily just related to medication. So it's important to, to, to voice that to your team and see if you need to see a specialist for testing. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think I know sometimes people can feel like they're in a bit of a fog, especially when they start gabapentin. But in terms of long term, I don't think we have a lot of strong evidence there. Uh, Ashraf, a quick question. I, I know that you joked earlier, five myeloma doctors gives you 15 opinions, especially when it comes to COVID. I always say we have more COVID experts in this country than COVID patients because everybody thinks they know and none of us really do. <laughs> but what is your opinion about waiting or taking time off of their current drugs for sake of the COVID vaccine. How are you doing it in Baltimore? Are you encouraging your patients to get the vaccine? And if so, are you adjusting their myeloma treatment to get it? No, we, we are encouraging everybody to get the, 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 the myeloma vaccine. We have done a study here looking at antibodies for patients on treatment. Uh, some of the patients on the call I see have been on this trial. Um, the only thing that I might advise, and actually it's not even established, is to stop the dexamethasone uh, just one week after the vaccination or two weeks after the vaccination. Um, uh, daratumumab, uh, you know, if you're taking it once a month, it's not a big deal, um, but the imids are good. So if you are on Revlimid, please continue that. Don't stop that treatment. There is data that actually Revlimid help boost the immune response to vaccinations in general. And there is data from... Uh, Hopkins that uh, patients of Revlimid has better immunity against pneumococcal vaccine, for example. So we expect the same, uh, and hepatitis. So I expect the same to be with COVID. Um, just before I finish mentioning Hopkins, I appreciate all what you guys are doing about University of Maryland. I just want to mention that at University of Maryland, there are two other colleagues of mine that treat only myeloma patients, Dr. Kugulu and Dr. Atanovich. I just want to mention also that Baltimore it's very lucky to have another group down the street uh, in a hospital called Hopkins, you might have heard about. Um, they, uh, they also treat myeloma and my colleague Ivan Borello and uh, Carol mm -hmm. Huff and Ali Abbas are excellent myeloma physicians. So um, please uh, enjoy uh, the fact that we have so many physicians focused on myeloma as a disease. Uh, some of other colleagues like focused on CAR T-cell, like my colleague, Dr. Rappaport, who's done a lot of work on T-cell therapy. So we have a lot of resources. It's not just me. It's not just University of Maryland. I like to think so, but unfortunately, not true. No, it's Thank true. You, you have, are you're blessed very much in that area with so many great docs. Now, we're going to have to wrap up. But Kelly, before I turn it back over to you, just uh, Bonnie, any final words you want to share with the group? All the roads traveled are different. Um, no two myeloma patients are the same. So again, find what, go to your docs, develop the relationship and find what makes you happy. You know, your friends, family, going fishing, whatever it is, but live your life. Myeloma does not define you. Absolutely. I think it reminds me of a patient I had back in Canada, Bonnie, who always used to say when I came in, when she came to the clinic, she says, Dr. McHale, please don't refer to it as my myeloma. It's not mine. Um, <laughs> it was given to me. It's not mine. And so, um, you know, again, I, t I absolutely resonate with that uh, statement that we are not defined by our disease. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Amy. I want to thank Ashraf. I want to thank Bonnie for being uh, just extraordinary today. I really think this has been a very productive workshop. Sorry, we didn't get to all the questions. I think we got to the lion's share of them. I remind people, as Kelly will share, that we do have a helpline that people can call during the day uh, to follow up on any of these. And this indeed will be available. Um, this, this whole uh, workshop and slides will be available. But Kelly, I'll turn it to you, boss, to uh, walk us through the survey and wrap up. Well, gosh, I'm kind of speechless myself. Bonnie, you are fantastic. Thank Both you. doctors, fantastic. And Amy, well, Amy might not be here, but I, I love working with her. Something that's incredibly important to us, and this will help future generations of myeloma, please fill out the feedback. We need to know how we can help you better. I know it's not a sentence, but we are here on a platform of 31 years. That's a heavy platform with a lot of rebar, and it's made it through several Los Angeles earthquakes. So with all that being said, myeloma 
www.thepacific.org. Our website is open 24-7, and we welcome you at any time, especially those on steroids at 2 o'clock in the morning. Please come and join us. Please be part of the IMF. Thank you.